Hey guys, this is Eli and this time we are going to take a look at a basic workflow for when you want to create your first Octane project in Cinema 4D. So some time ago Brian from Real Engineering contacted me to create some nice visuals of the SR71 Blackbird. For previous videos I always used the default render engine of Cinema 4D and to be honest that looked great already. However I've been using Octane Render a lot lately and its GPU based render times would give me the ability to render more content which looks better and also renders a bit faster. So let's go over the typical steps I take to create this kind of video content. First of all, I don't model the airplanes from scratch. That alone would blow all the video budget and there is so much room for error and I just don't know enough about engineering and airplanes in general. So my first step is finding a good quality 3D model on TurboSquid or CG Trader. I'm very happy with their services so far and there usually are nice deals on both. The first thing I look for is the file formats. I don't want to go over the hassle of converting the files so I need either an OBJ or an FBX file or preferably a Cinema 4D file format. It is not really required to get a model that is already a Cinema 4D file but it saves you a lot of time and trouble getting the textures to work for example so if it is available I go for that of course. If I find something I like I go through the thumbnails and look for the amount of detail, the 3D topology, how good it is, how sharp the textures look and if the model is just one solid object or nicely separated in parts. So I can close the wheels or move the flaps for example. Also a detailed description is a good sign of quality and effort. And finally I also check the technical info at the site. An insane high poly count will make the renders too slow. So for an airplane anything above 2 or 3 thousand would become suspicious. But it depends on the kind of model of course. Any model that goes above a million polygons will become a bit of an issue quickly, so I would avoid that. If you found what you like you can buy and download the model of course. So before jumping into Cinema 4D let's take a look at Octane Render. You could choose to buy it for the expensive price or you can also just go for the subscription model which is a much better option if you're not sure if you need it every month. But before buying it straight away I recommend just playing with the demo version first until you're getting the hang of it. You can also check the manual they provide with it. The only noticeable limitations of the demo are that you get a watermark on your render and a limited resolution. But you can still create content, save it and use it with the full license later. So the first years of working with Octane I actually only used the demo version and let it render on someone else's machine that had the full license. Ok so when you're in Cinema 4D you want to know where to find Octane. If everything is installed correctly you should find it at the top here. The live viewer is what you are searching for. Sometimes it takes a while to open because the plugin is logging in to your account. So when that's opened up this window will show your render result once you hit the logo icon at the left. Another thing you probably want to do is assigning a spot where this window can sit while working. So if you drag this square dots icon to any place on the screen it will put itself in between the two lines of the other area. If you want to get rid of it just click the icon and undock it or close it completely. One more thing I'm already going to tell you is that you'll need to create Octane specific materials. You can do that by clicking create in the materials section, go to shader, cinema 4D Octane and pick Octane material. In here it looks pretty similar to the native material system but we will take a closer look in just a moment. Another cool thing you get in the full Octane license is the open live database. When you open that you get access to a lot of pre-built materials that look very realistic. If you find something you like you just right click on it and pick download. Alright so enough about the very basics let's take a look at the model I bought. I just downloaded the Cinema 4D version and its textures. Because of the large textures and the hyper nerves are smoothing that is enabled by default it can take a while before the model shows up in the viewport so don't be worried. So once everything is loaded you can tell the textures kind of look like crap but that is just the viewport. An actual render looks super good already, even without Octane. But let's take a look at what it looks like in Octane with the materials as they are right now. You get a very similar result but you can see some differences at the windows for example. Anyway we need to convert the native materials to Octane ones anyway. Luckily there is an easy feature for that. So just select the materials, go to plugin, octane and convert to materials. Once that's done you can remove the alt ones if you want to. Ok so I'm going to set up the live viewer again and add an octane camera. 
The regular one also works just as well, but the Octane camera has lots of nice little features which we will cover in just a minute. So let's take a look at our materials. Everything looks pretty similar, just different names than usual, and we have this note editor at the top here. To be honest I rarely use it, because it's just a visual way of looking at what we have on this other window, so for more complicated materials it is easier to do it in the notes for example, but for the simple stuff I just don't go into there. Also an important difference is the drop down at the top here. You can pick a diffuse material, that's a pretty simple one, it mostly gives you a flat and rough result. The glossy material is the one you will be using the most, it can be tweaked to the most realistic results in my opinion. The specular one is what you will be using for anything that is glass or water for example. Metallic can be used for anything metal, but I personally prefer faking it with the glossy material. And finally you will also find a tune shader if you want to. So let's stick with glossy for now and go over what the different channels do. The diffuse channel is what originally was the color channel. And so in here you define the main color or the image texture. Notice how every image is put into an image texture node of Octane. To avoid later issues you should stick with that method. Another quick tip is that you can add a color correction node on top of that, to quickly adjust the texture without having to go into Photoshop for example. The specular channel defines how shiny the material will look. Right now that is defined by a texture, but if we disable that and adjust the float slider, which basically goes between pure white and black, you can see the difference. The roughness slider is quite straightforward, you often need it at least at some small value, so it is not super reflective. We can skip anisotropy, I've never used that before. The sheen layer is also an overlooked one, but it can give you that extra fake highlight that separates the object from the background, so it can be used wisely. The bump channel is just the usual stuff. Same for displacement, but it is much better than the native one. And then the last one I want to mention is the index channel. That one defines how reflective your material is, so a higher value is almost a mirror finish, and for some reason a value of 1 is also a mirror, I don't know why. Okay, the materials actually look pretty good as they are, just the glass needs a bit of work. In order to get a correct result we need some kind of environment so it can reflect and refract. So I created an AGR environment and load in an AGRI which I downloaded somewhere, so that looks better, but I don't think the real windows look that see-through, so I'd rather start from scratch with a new Octane material. I can then already just drag and drop that new one on top of the original while holding Alt on the keyboard, that will automatically replace it and apply it to the correct objects. I could go with a metallic shader for this one, but that just doesn't work the way I wanted to, so I take the glossy one, making it more reflective with the index value and darker in the diffused channel a bit rougher as well, and maybe not as reflective as it is right now, but it can still be fine-tuned a bit with the specular channel. At the moment we are relying on just the HDRI sky for the lighting, but it can also be combined with the Octane Daylight. So when you created that you can rotate it, and in its settings there is also much more to do. Of course we have the power, but also the sky turbidity, which makes it look more overcast. Also the sun size is something that is overlooked, try to pay attention to the shadows. A small sun gives hard shadows, and a large one gives a smoother result. I personally prefer a smoother shadow lately. You can also notice how the HDRI background is gone. You can blend the two light sources together with the checkbox at the bottom here. Another interesting thing you can do to fake your way through everything is adding a different HDRI background that doesn't affect the lighting. So I make a duplicate of this environment and set the type to visible environment. So let's change the color so you can see the background is different, but the light remains intact. Ok, one more lighting trick I want to show you is the Octane Area Light. You can also use a targeted light, which is nice in this scenario. This area light is way more position and angle dependent than the native one. Basically think of it as a real life light source. When I'm working with this kind of stuff I like to have the live view locked, but still be able to move around in the viewport. You can do that by picking another of the four viewports, changing it to perspective and putting it in a mode you prefer. I often like to put a rim light behind the object. The power doesn't need to stay 100 on such a large light, you often go somewhere between 2 and 20 if it's up close. 
With the temperature slider you can tell how warm the light will look or not. You can also tweak how it affects the objects, for example only having it reflect without making everything brighter, or only making it brighter with no reflections. Another important thing to do is setting the opacity to zero, so you don't see it in the background of course. Alright, you probably get the idea by now of how simple it can be to work with Octane. Let's check out some of its kernel settings as they call it. You can find those by clicking the cogwheel. First of all, let me mention this window is extremely annoying when scrolling with the mouse wheel. Just don't do it, because you will scroll through different settings instead of moving down, so I recommend enlarging the window. An important thing is the render mode at the top here. There's different ones to choose from. People often prefer path tracing or PMC for the most realistic results, but I find it to be rather complicated and especially slow to render. So slow that it serves no use for my animations. So I prefer to stick with just direct lighting, but that is just me. In here you can still choose between the global illumination modes. For scenes that are in the open sky with few objects that cast shadows, ambient occlusion is just fine. It is super fast and you can't tell the difference from the diffuse mode. But let's say you're doing something indoors or with a lot of objects that are close to each other, you will start to notice the difference. Basically the diffuse mode gives a more realistic result because it calculates the light bounces nicely, while ambient occlusion just fakes that. Another thing to mention is the amount of samples. Go higher to get less noise in the shadows, but it will also take longer to render of course. A simple way to figure out how many samples you need is using the render region tool. Just draw a rectangle over the part that is noisy and look at the sample count right below it. At 700 I found it to be decent in this case, so change your amount of samples to that. But that's the samples on the whole thing. We don't need that many on the bright parts for example, so it is a good idea to enable the adaptive sampling too. In there you set the minimum amount it has to render, but it will still refine the noisy areas. Great, so now we can go to one of my favorite parts, which are the camera settings. Make sure you click on the tag and not the object itself. For example, you can add a motion blur, but I would be careful with that, so maybe it's better to add that in post actually. Under the thin lens tab, you can increase the aperture for example, and get more depth of field. And with this F icon in the live viewer, you should be able to click anywhere in the viewport and define where the focus is. At the moment it doesn't do it precisely, but it should be fine in most cases. Ok, I'm going straight to the post processing tab, this is a fun one. In here you can get a bit of a softer and dreamier look. With the bloom and glare options, the reflections will get a nice glow. You can also adjust how the glare spreads. In my opinion adding a bit of both makes the scene a bit more convincing. Good, let's go back to the camera imager tab and enable it. Here you have some basic controls again, like the exposure of your shots, Oftentimes you will crank that up a bit, but you can compensate with the highlight compression, so some parts don't blow out as much. There's some more simple controls in here as well, like vignetting or saturation. And we also have the hot pixel removal here. In this render it doesn't look like we have any fireflies or white pixels, but if we decrease the amount of samples we will get some. So here on the wing you can see some bright noise going on. If we decrease the hot pixel removal, you will notice it actually gets blurrier and smoother, but if you want to keep very sharp detail on your render, you may want to keep it at a higher number. Then finally, my favorite part in this tab is the response. You can see it as a filter overlay, so every time I have my basic light setup going on and everything is set up, I like to scroll through this list of filters to see what kind of look can be achieved. It's not necessary to do this, but it can help you figure out some weaknesses of your current look. Now to wrap things up I want to mention some tips on how I achieved the animation for this video of Real Engineering. One thing I figured out is that when you're using an AGRI sky as the actual background, you can't pan the camera. It just looks fake when it is moving around because the background doesn't move at all, so you're better off only rotating the camera. An alternative is to move the object while rotating the camera. That looks a bit better than just panning. Another thing I usually do with the airplane animations is adding a vibration tag on there with a tiny bit of vibration on just the position and rotation. But you have to keep it very subtle on the values depending on how large the aircraft is of course. To be honest my end results all still have a bit too much wiggle to be realistic. Maybe one more thing I want to mention about animating the camera. 
If you want to rotate it smoothly around the subject, you want to use a target tag. I recommend targeting the camera at the separate null and not the actual object. That way you can freely move the null in order to get everything in frame. You can also animate that null to change the center of attention. Okay, so that is most of the stuff I wanted to cover. So when everything is done, you want to render this of course. It is really pretty much the same stuff as you are used to. All you have to do is set the render engine to Octane of course, and all else just works the same. One thing that I did notice though, is that rendering in the picture viewer is a lot heavier on the computer, compared to the render queue for example. So if you still want to do some other stuff while it is rendering, you may want to go for that option. It also comes with some other benefits, such as being able to queue multiple projects overnight, continuing a render where it is left off when everything crashed for example, and you still get the info on how long it takes to render your frames. Alright, so I know this was a lot, but I wanted to make sure I covered many basics to get you started without learning the whole thing from scratch. Let us know if this was useful to you, and I hope to see you back in the next video.